things like the firebombing of Dresden and other places, uh, may have been thought by some people at the time to be acceptable. I think they are thought by no one now to be acceptable because the law of war has evolved over time. But we can talk about that. My point, though, is that I believe that laws, the law of armed conflict, the rules that apply here, adherence to them is essential to what we believe and who we are as a nation. And we'll talk about that. I think it's particularly true in this new kind of asymmetrical war. It's embroiled us in a whole variety of, of critical topics that are related to legal issues, to what happens in international humanitarian law. We have Marines tying up and killing civilians in Haditha. We have contractors, civilians, in an organization called Blackwater who are just doing it whatever they want to in Iraq. We have Abu Ghraib. You know what Abu Ghraib is? You know, am I, I mean, I'm not sure if. Military prison in Iraq. Military prison in Iraq. And what happened there? We horribly mistreated prisoners, and in some cases, tortured them, probably. Um, we've had targeted killing. We've had detainees that we've held at Guantanamo Bay since November 2001. Why did we put them there? Because we were going to have military commissions to prosecute them, civilians. Um, anybody know why we decided November 2001 President Bush or issued an order, an executive order, declaring that we would have military commissions at Guantanamo Bay to, to prosecute these people whom we'd captured who were fighting this war on terror against us. And why did we do that? In part, that's why we put them in Guantanamo. But why, we do, why did we decide to prosecute them by military? Well, let me go back. What did we do with terrorists before 10 years ago Sunday. Before 9-11, what did we do with them? What did we consider them to be? Criminals. And what do we do with them if we captured them? Prosecuted them in federal court. Prosecuted the people who tried to blow up the World Trade Center the first time in federal district court in New York. 9-11 changed our perception of things. One of the reasons to have military commissions, at least at the time, was that they, they would be so much quicker and easier. We would take these people to trial quickly and, and have swift justice. Has that happened? Not at all. I think what we've done over time is picked and chosen what parts of international humanitarian law we like and might be applied here and what parts we, we don't really like and so we're not gonna follow them. And we've tried to somehow tread this path between treating terrorism as a crime and treating it as a violation of international humanitarian law and we've done it in ways that I think in many cases have not served our nation very well. Uh, so why is it important to talk about this? Well. We do have this new kind of unprincipled enemy who flaunts these rules and really takes advantage of the fact that we follow them. So the argument goes, why should we handcuff ourselves? Let's take the gloves off. These are really bad guys. The only thing that they're going to understand is more violence against them than they practice against us. We have to meet them on their own terms. That's the only thing that they'll understand. I think coupled with that is, in some quarters, a disdain for international law that says, well, that's really just for wimps. There's no enforcement to it. And for a country like ours, it's so powerful and so strong, and we have our own national self-interest, we shouldn't be restricted by international law. Even international humanitarian law. Let's take a step back and figure out where that came from, where international law, particularly as it regards to the law of armed conflict, international humanitarian law comes from. We, for years, centuries, we didn't have any law of war. We had rules of warfare that most civilized countries followed. Where, where did they come from? Anyone know? 
How did you know that you, when you captured someone, you didn't kill them? Say it again. Well, that's where it comes from now. It really, the first rules of warfare arose from chivalry, how you treat people in the right way. There were no laws of war, no written down laws of war until actually the year 1863. And the first time that it was done was the Lieber Code, written for the Union Army in the Civil War. Franz Lieber wrote down the rules of war. He didn't make them up. He just knew sort of what the practices were. And he wrote down the Lieber Code, which was the first ever organized set of a code that applied to warfare. By the end of the Civil War, the Confederacy had adopted it. It became the quarry from which all the other codes in the future were, were, were taken. Uh, countries in Europe started to follow the Lieber Code. Coincidentally, the same year the Lieber Code started, in 1863, in Europe was the first time that we had a Geneva Convention. The first one was on the treatment of wounded and sick. And so the law of war has, is only a little more than a century old. It's evolved over time. It's evolving now. So we talked about the Geneva Conventions. The first one was in 1863. Then we had World War I, the war to end all wars. In 1929, we came up with two Geneva Conventions, one on wounded and sick and one on the treatment of prisoners. And then what happens? several years later. World War II, and what happens in World War II? Dresden firebombing, what else? Holocaust. Unit 731, all kinds of atrocities on all sides. And so the civilized nations of the world came together in Geneva and said, we have got to come up with some kind of enforcement mechanism and some kind of rules that apply to all of us. And so they drafted, crafted the Geneva Conventions of 1949. How many are there? There are four. And so here's a trick for you. If you hear a commentator on television or a politician or someone else say, the Geneva Convention says, the first thing you ought to ask is, which one? Because that probably means they don't know exactly what they're talking about. There are four Geneva Conventions. Wounded and sick, the wounded and sick at sea, prisoners of war, and the fourth one from 1949 is the treatment of civilians in wartime. First ever treaty passed that affected civilians in wartime. And what, why was it, why did we do that? Because of what happened in World War II. Now, the Geneva Conventions are treaties. They are, well, that's what they are. They call, convention is simply another word for treaty. There are 193 countries in the world. How many of those countries do you think have ratified the Geneva Conventions? A hundred and ninety-three. All of them. Every country has ratified these treaties. As far as I know, it's the only treaty in the world you can say that about. I mean, even Libya, North Korea, countries that are rogue states or whatever the current terminology is have ratified the Geneva Conventions. And we've ratified them. In fact, this country was one of the leaders in drafting them. What do they require? They, they, they require you to enforce the provisions domestically. If someone violates the provisions of those conventions, particularly in what's called grave breaches, the most serious kinds of war crimes, you have to take action against them. Do we do that? Does the United States do that? Do we prosecute people for committing war crimes? We do. Do other countries? Yes, some of them do. Russia has prosecuted some of their officers who are involved in atrocities in Chechnya. 
There have been prosecutions in Indonesia. There have been prosecutions in Israel. It's not a perfect system, but it does happen. We're required to do that by being a, a signatory or someone who's ratified those conventions. They also require us to educate our armed forces about what they, what's contained in them, to disseminate them, and as I said, to enforce them. So that means something, but there's something else it means too for us in this country, and it's again contained in Article 6 of the Constitution, which says that the Constitution itself, laws passed in pursuance of, and all treaties made under the authority of the United States are the supreme law of the land. So this is not just international law floating out there in the ether. It is the supreme law of the land because it is a ratified treaty of the United States passed under the provisions of the Constitution. So I want to go to torture and talk about torture for a couple of minutes and how I think the Constitution applies here because the Geneva Conventions outlaw torture. We've also ratified the International Convention Against Torture and Cruel and Inhumane Treatment, Inhumane and Degrading Treatment, another ratified treaty. But torture is thought of differently right now in the United States. In fact, there's been a shift in the attitudes of Americans. More than 50% in a recent survey said they think torture is acceptable. In American Red Cross survey, more than 60% of teenagers said that waterboarding and other forms of torture were okay. More than half said that they approved of killing the captured enemy if the enemy had killed Americans. And about 40% thought it was permissible for American troops to be tortured overseas. I think they've been exposed to the techniques but not to the rules and to the laws and to why we should not torture. Certainly been exposed to societal influences in pop culture, the television show 24, among others. Several years ago when I was the dean at West Point, I was invited to go out to Los Angeles and to visit with the executive producer and the writers of the show 24 to talk to them about torture and why I thought their depictions of it on television were not particularly serving us well. I mean, it, I know it's television, it's not real life, but pop culture does inform opinions and actions, and all you have to do is ask any prosecutor these days about the effect of the CSI shows on television. Any jury comes to court looking for the things that they see on television that really don't exist. But if you don't prove that, you're not really going to win your case. And the same thing applies to some extent when you see torture depicted as always patriotic, morally right, effective, the way to get to your objective that saves the country. Um, it was an interesting experience. The reporting of it afterwards, there were some news articles written about the visit we had out there. My favorite headline was from the UK Independent. It said, US military to Kiefer, stop torture or else. I don't know what the or else was gonna be. <laughs> uh, maybe we were gonna torture him. <laughs> but what I'm here really tonight to talk about is, or to tell you is that I think torture is neither legal, practical, effective or morally right, probably for any country, but certainly for the United States. So I have seven reasons why I believe torture is not something we should adhere to. First, it's ineffective. It doesn't work, despite what you see on television, despite what you see in the movies, if you talk to any experienced FBI or military interrogator, they will tell you that torture doesn't work. It's unreliable. Why? Why is it unreliable? They'll tell you anything. Senator John McCain, 
shot down over North Vietnam and held captive for many years, tortured horribly, a great advocate against the use of torture by the United States because he knows the effects of it. And what did he do under torture? He confessed to all kinds of things because that's what people will do. You can look at academic studies. You can look at appellate case law. You can look at the, the, what the prisoners from Guantanamo disclosed. And you can't find a time when torture gave you information that was helpful. Uh, at one point when we disclosed, the administration disclosed that we'd had these hidden overseas sites that we had deported people to, President Bush talked about how we had used these sites and enhanced interrogation to get particular information that he talked about. But if you parse that carefully and looked at those examples, didn't fit because we had that information in other ways and the timing wasn't right for when those people were captured. Maybe it's disingenuous to say that it might never succeed, but at what cost is it to you as a person and as a country? The killing of Osama bin Laden has kind of reignited this whole idea that supposedly some of the information that led to finding him was obtained under enhanced interrogation. But if you listen to it carefully, what they said is people who were tortured, let's use the right word for it, lied about things. And because they lied, we were able to turn back their lies and then find someone who led us to Osama bin Laden. Isn't that bizarre? We've tortured them so that they give us inaccurate information and then follow that inaccurate information. If you look at Kiefer Sutherland on 24, in a typical season of that show, he probably engages in patriotic torture five or six times, which means five or six times a day in a 24-hour period, he finds it necessary to torture somebody. There's a recent Brown University study that says what any experienced interrogator will tell you, that it's building of rapport, not necessarily friendship, but building of a rapport and positive reinforcement that really is going to help you get information from people. In fact, now, years later at Guantanamo, as interrogators have built some rapport with some of those captives, they've actually gotten information about the organization of Al-Qaeda and the organization of terrorist cells that they didn't get under torture. It, it really, it takes some time, you're not gonna get an immediate effect, but that's how you get information from people. I think one of the interesting twists on this is where did we get, where did we arrive at these techniques that we used at Abu Ghraib, at Guantanamo, in other places to torture our, these captives? Where do we get them? We actually took them from the United States Air Force's search and rescue school that they had and they had reverse engineered what the Chinese communists did in North Korea. And in fact, the study that was written was Chinese communist methods to extract false confessions. So that's what we're using to interrogate people. It, it really, if you think about it, it's bizarre. The second reason related is you really get no actionable intelligence from torturing someone. So why violate the law and ethics and morality to rough someone up who really isn't gonna help you? Now, you're gonna have people who bring up the ticking bomb scenario. Well, what if they're, you know, you have someone captured, you know there's a nuclear bomb, I mean, this is 24 all the time. You know there's a nuclear bomb about to go off, you have that person who can tell you where that bomb is. It's a sham. I mean, the chances of all of those events happening are so infinitesimal. It, it's just that, that, that you capture the person you know planted the bomb, you know that there's a bomb, you know that he or, or she has information about it. First of all, if it's this current group of people that we're fighting and we capture them, they know a bomb is gonna go off in 24 or 48 hours 
What are they likely to do when we torture them? I think they're going to send you in other areas. I think they're going to give you all kinds of misinformation. They don't, I mean, to them, sacrificing themselves is in a great cause. Sacrificing other people is fine. Torture isn't going to work in that scenario. Plus, it, it, the ticking bomb scenario is one that people will use to try and persuade you that, well, in some circumstances, torture is okay. Uh, just to get you to walk back from that. And of course, people will ask you, well, they ask me this, well, if your wife was kidnapped and you captured somebody who knew about it, wouldn't you torture them to get her freed? And I think most of us would probably answer yes. I would in that circumstance. Not everyone would. I think you would, but unlikely personal circumstances are not what should inform national policy. I mean, this is a much bigger issue than one individual. Third, and this one, this is my third reason, it relates more to the military than anything else. It's clear that units and individuals who engage in this, it promotes other battlefield misconduct. You cannot have a unit that ignores some rules and follows others. We've seen it time and time again in history. Lieutenant Callie's platoon in My Lai. Uh, there's a West Point graduate, Lieutenant Colonel Nate Sassman, who's ordered his unit in Iraq to throw two Iraqis off a bridge because they were out after curfew. The resulting cover-up led to other crimes as well. You cannot do one thing wrong and not have it affect your entire unit. One of the reasons that we say we follow the law of armed conflict, that we want to follow this, that we want our forces to follow it, is for reciprocity, because we want to be treated fairly if we're captured as well. That's why the United States does this. And you can look at examples from World War II. Germany and Italy, prisoners were treated much more fairly than in the Far East. And so there were atrocities more on both sides in the Far East because the Japanese didn't, didn't adhere to the Geneva Conventions at the time, they, and the United States answered in kind, and other countries did as well. You cannot start ignoring rules and think that you can only follow some of them. This, I had, uh, I've had lots of cadets and lieutenants over time say to me, well, if it means saving the lives of my soldiers, I'll do whatever, whatever, it need, whatever is necessary. But that is the ultimate slippery slope. What doesn't involve saving the lives of your soldiers? If, if you are going to torture someone to save the lives of your soldiers, what is it that you won't do? The lives of your soldiers, if you're a military officer, are always in the balance. That's what they're there for. Uh, infantry attacks take lives. All kinds of things take lives. Torture doesn't, in, which leads to my fourth reason, in the long run, I'm not sure it saves any lives anyway. It's counterproductive in the long run. There are historical examples here as well. If you look at France and their fight in Algeria, and there's a great movie, The Battle of Algiers, the French resorted to torture in an effort to stop the counterinsurgency. It backfired on them completely and still has had an impact on the French army decades later. Israel, plagued by terrorists at times, decided that they would allow what they called moderate physical pressure in a ticking bomb scenario. That is, if they captured a terrorist whom they thought might have information about a bomb got to, about to go off, they allowed moderate physical pressure. What do you suppose happened? The moderate physical pressure didn't work. So what did they do? They increased the pressure. And they might not have captured the individual, but maybe they had a member of his family. And so they started using moderate or heavier physical pressure and torture against them until the Israeli Supreme Court stepped in and said, no, 
this is not right. And did it stop terrorist attacks against Israel? Probably increased them more than anything else. In fact, we have our own recent history. We've captured in the last several years a number of people who are involved in what they call the jihad. They are terrorists, and, they, and some of them come from terrible backgrounds, very downtrodden, but many of them are from what you might consider well-to-do families in the Middle East, but they turned to terrorism, particularly against the United States, to fighting our forces in Iraq and Afghanistan. And when we would ask them, not under torture, but just interrogate them, why are you doing this? Why did you join? What do you think their main reason was? Because of the pictures they saw from Abu Ghraib and because of what they knew of what we had done at Guantanamo. So what we had done in mistreating prisoners, in torturing people, was create more terrorists, more people who are going to fight us. General Petraeus, just recently retired and took over the CIA, but certainly a leader in, in the fight in Iraq and Afghanistan over the past several years, said, such expedient methods, enhanced interrogation, torture, those things are non-biodegradable. The enemy continues to beat you with them like a stick. We didn't act as we should. We created more terrorists than preventing terrorist attacks. And we didn't do what we said we were about. My fifth reason is torture erodes character. It erodes the character and soul of the person who tortures. You can read all kinds of accounts of people, the nightmare and the shames that they have, the shame they have that they describe from, from torturing someone unless they're a psychopath. It, it has an effect on them. And Ultimately, I think it erodes the character of an organization or even the character of a nation. My sixth reason, and this one means something to me because I am a lawyer, it's unlawful. Torture is prohibited by any military code you can find in any country, by our domestic criminal system, by an international treaty regime that we've ratified, by the, we convicted Germans at the Nuremberg trials for torture. As I said, Article 6 says that those treaties are part of the supreme law of the land. It's, our country's about the rule of law and the role of law. One country, even as powerful as we are, can't change what those treaties say any more than Libya or North Korea can say what they say. We can't say that waterboarding is not torture for us. In fact, let me talk about waterboarding for a minute. We learned about waterboarding in the Philippine insurrection of the 1890s. And we prosecuted US military officers for waterboarding their captives. We thought it was torture then, it is torture now. There's no doubt about it. My seventh reason, and really the most important one to me, is that torture is simply wrong. It's morally wrong. Are you going to risk your honor and your integrity, who you are as a person, in my case as an officer, the nation you represent, to do something like this, particularly now. We're engaged in a war. As much as anything, it's a war of public opinion. Where's our international standing right now? What do we believe in? What do people believe about us? Think about where this country was on September the 12th, 2001. The headlines in the newspapers in France said, we are all Americans. There were demonstrations on the streets of Tehran in favor of the United States. 
But we've squandered all that, most of it, in large measure because of the actions we've taken that go against what we say we believe in as a country. General Colin Powell, former Secretary of State, wrote that the world is starting to doubt the moral underpinnings of the war on terror. What do we look like when we engage in torture? When this country engages in torture, what do we look like to the world? The people we're fighting against. I think we look like hypocrites. We say we're about the rule of law and the role of law. We say we're, I mean, who do we see ourselves as? Who are we? Who are we as a country? If this was a Western movie, who would we be? We're the good guys. Don't we believe that? That we're the good guys? We're there for the right reasons? We're there to bring freedom and democracy, or at least some sort of participatory government? That we stand against torture? That we believe in the rule of law? We need to remember what Nietzsche said, that he who fights with monsters must take care to thereby not become a monster. How can we be about freedom if we use or condone torture? What we condemned prior to 9-11. I think that where we stand on this issue defines our national values. The cadet prayer at West Point says, help me to choose the harder right instead of the easier wrong. And I think in a war like this, fighting an enemy like this, it's even more important to adhere to the rules and the morality that we know is right. I think it's simple to profess your belief in principles and values, in ethics, when the path is easy. It's when times are tough when you face an enemy like this, that you find out what do you really believe in, what do you stand for. This is not the first war that we fought that these issues have been raised. Let me tell you about a prior war we were involved in. It was a very nasty war on both sides. And American leaders believed it wasn't enough to win. They thought they also had to win in a way that was consistent with the values of their society and their principles. And not all Americans agreed because they looked at the enemy and said, look what they're doing. They are giving our soldiers no quarter. They're executing them. They are taking civilian property. They are killing civilians. They are doing all kinds of horrible things, and the only thing that they're going to understand, the only way that we're going to get through to them is to meet them on their own terms, to fight their force with force, sort of the, what we believe now, the only answer is more force. But the American leadership in that war said, no, this country believes in a principle of humanity we are going to treat the captives that we take in the way that we know is right, not necessarily in the way that the other side is doing it. Do you know what war that was? It was the Revolutionary War, and the enemy was the British. So to me, this is not just about the moral stance that our country has now and what we believe in now. This is about the principles that this nation was founded on. That this, we, we became a new kind of nation, one that had never been seen before in the world. Believing in human rights, believing in limited government, but believing in decency and in treating people well. That's our heritage. We've lost sight of it somewhat in this war on terror, but we should not engage in acts of torture or anything like that 
it betrays what America is about. I'm happy to take your questions if you have any. To say, if you have a question for President Finnegan, please proceed to the two microphones in the aisles. We'll start on this side and then just uh, change back each side uh, until he's done answering questions. Thank you. Hi, President Finnegan. It's great to hear what you have to say. I think it's timely and it's important. Did you say that in the case of your wife being taken that you would change your opinion? You know, <laughs> if, if, it, if it, probably if it came to that in my personal situation, I think most people would say they would do anything. I know, but what does that mean in this context? Not that we even know, can know because it hasn't been presented to us. Well, I think, it's a, I think in a very difficult, very personal situation, you might react differently. But I, as I said, I don't think that that's what should inform national policy on the larger question. But didn't you say when times get tough, that's when you should stand by? Yeah. That's right. I just want to acknowledge that maybe when it is your wife, someone whom you love very much, you might say, in this case, I'll change, although you're right. It's when times are tough that you should adhere to your principles. Well, that's honest of you. Thank you. Okay. Hey, dear sir. Mm -hmm. um, based on your stance and opinion of the law, should uh, former President Bush and his administration be prosecuted for violating international law? Why or why not? I think President Bush and his administration were ill-served by some of the lawyers that they relied on. And I think that they gave them some legal cover by saying that the things that we were engaging in were not torture or not covered by the Convention Against Torture. Um, I don't know if they should be prosecuted for violation, violating international law. They, they, I think that what they did was not right. I'm not sure that we would prosecute a president, um, but I think they ought not to travel overseas probably to some of the countries <laughs> that might, might be willing, because the Geneva Conventions have universal jurisdiction and any country that has ratified them can prosecute people under them. Uh, I don't want to excuse anything that happened, uh, but if you remember the days after 9-11, there was a near panic, and I think some of these people, in their efforts to protect this country, went too far. Uh, I think it would be ultimately harmful if the leaders of the country were prosecuted. Thank you. Hi, I'm from Mount Vernon, Virginia, where George Washington's estate is. There, there's a museum, and it had a video for talking about George Washington as a mm -hmm. president. And in the video, they state that when George Washington's troops captured the British in Boston, um, uh, George Washington taught the world a lesson on humanity, saying that he wouldn't allow his troops to torture any of the captives. And I just want to know, what would you have done it, when we captured Osama bin Laden? We didn't capture him, but if we had, would you have said execution or just rot in prison? Execution or what? Rot in prison. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think... Um, before either of those is trial. Well, yeah. Uh, but if convicted and given the rights that he, the rights that he should have at a trial, I would favor execution. I mean, I. 
I, <clears throat> I do believe that there are times when the death penalty is appropriate. I think he's an example. That may not, I, I know there are people who don't believe in the death penalty and I respect that very much. I think uh, in that circumstance, I, I would have no problem with the death penalty. I believe in the death penalty too. <laughs> but thank you. Um, speaking about Osama bin Laden, um, do you feel that it was okay to make an exception that we didn't try to capture him, put him on trial, and that we killed him upon sight? Or do you feel that we should have captured, at least put him on trial, and then put him to death, if you believe that's right? Well, it's hard to know without knowing exactly what sure. happened there. Uh, I think, having worked with a lot of those units over the time, they're, I mean, they were shot at it at that site from, from the reports anyway. Uh, the question is whether they, they were threatened, mm -hmm. whether they perceived a threat to their own lives and they can, they can act in self-defense. I hope it wasn't just an execution. I mean, if we'd found him sleeping in his bed, we shouldn't have shot him. Uh, if he tried to absolutely surrender, then we shouldn't have shot him. But if he is a credible threat to the people who are there, then they have every right to defend themselves by, by shooting him. All right, thank you. Um, if I may, oh Lord, sorry about that. <laughs> At the end of the American Civil War, uh, the commander of Andersonville Prison, Henry Wurz, was executed for crimes against uh, humanity and war crimes, right. specifically related to the neglect of prisoners. Now, the, the cause of that neglect, I'll admit, is up for some debate. Having said that, there are times when travesties are unfortunately um, inevitable. I hate to say it, but there are times that things just happen in war. To what extent is that considered torture? I mean, these men were left to rot in prison. It's not their fault they were there, and it's not their fault their commander couldn't take care of them. I mean, what happens in that case? Well, I think he was, at, he was prosecuted because he had the means to take care of them and didn't. I mean, that was the allegation against him was that he ignored their plight, that he didn't get them food, he didn't get them the shelter they needed. Um, it is, I mean, actually he was prosecuted because he violated the Libra Code, which the Confederacy and the, and the Union had, uh, had adopted. But you're right. It, 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 to some extent, the question is whether it's victor's justice, where you come in, you've won the war, and you simply prosecute someone who's done some, something that may be the result of events beyond their control. And that, that was his defense. He said that he didn't have the means to do anything to, to protect these prisoners. So it, you hope that the prosecution of someone who's accused of a war crime is fair. Sometimes it probably is not because of the emotions that come up. Uh, but there certainly were lots of prisoners who died at Andersonville under his care. And, and I think that's why he was prosecuted and, and later executed. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. There are no easy questions out there, are there? Excuse me? How do we get our honor back? I don't think it's something that's done quickly. I think uh, the executive order that President Obama issued shortly after taking office that, that we would not do these enhanced interrogations or, or torture is a first step. Uh, I hope that at some point we can, we can close Guantanamo, although that's a very difficult issue because there are, I, I visited there and I'll tell you that there are some people there that want to kill us uh, and, and I'm not sure what you do with them. We need to keep hold of them so that they don't go and find other ways to kill us and our friends. But I think, I think it's symbolically it would be a very good thing to to close Guantanamo Bay. 
Um, and I think we need to engage in discussions about why we did wh what we did and why it's not right for us. I mean, if you look at World War II, when we detained Japanese Americans, it took us decades to acknowledge that that was wrong, that it was an overreaction. Uh, it may take us a while in this country now to, to realize that some of the things we did after 9-11 were not in keeping with the values that we really aspire to. And I'd say it's really up to this generation to make sure that as a nation and as individuals, we don't do those kinds of things in the future. Well, thanks for your attention tonight. Once again, let's thank uh, President Finnegan for his very timely and interesting presentation. I would also like to thank the American Democracy Project at this time for sponsoring this event, including donating of the constitutions that you are uh, allowed to take with you and the refreshments in the lobby, the light refreshments in the lobby. Uh, please pick up your copy of the Constitution on your way out if you've not already done so, and enjoy the refreshments, and thank you very much for coming.